Book One, Chapter Six of Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, Book One, Chapter Six. Ten to one, bar one. Ten to one, bar one. Ten to one, bar one. The ring is roaring itself hoarse over these words. The hubbub is deafening. It reverberates all around. It echoes and re-echoes through the hot June air. It is Derby Day. The waving downs of Epsom are alive with people. They swarm over every cranny and nook of the wide-stretching space on either side of the straight run-in. They surge to and fro like a sea of dark, moving matter. They contribute to the busy air of life that has established its reign on all around. It is a great day. Always crowded, Epsom is more than usually so. Old habitués of the place declare that never in their memories, and some of them have pretty old ones, can they recollect such a swarming throng. But the reason for all this crowd is an excellent one. Have not the people come to see the great horse win? He is in the paddock now, and is being stripped for the saddling bell has rung. He is the center of a pushing, hustling throng, all eager to catch a glimpse of the unbeaten hero of the day. For have not his triumphs been such as a horse and its owner might be well proud of, carrying as he does the laurels of the Dewhurst plate, the Middle Park plate, and the two thousand guineas upon him? What a grand-looking horse he is! how his rich, ruddy chestnut coat glistens in the sun like armor of burnished gold. Such a quiet beast, too, neither snatching nor stamping nor doing aught that a restive or vicious racehorse would. "'He can't be beat!' exclaims a young man who has been standing silently watching the stripping process. "'I'll be a man or a mouse, Flory. I'll stand every penny I've got on him, or lose all, hanged if I won't!' "'Don't be a fool, Reggie,' answers the lady addressed. She is close beside him and has laid her hand on his arm. It is Flora Desmond. "'Fool or no fool,' he answers quickly. "'I mean to have this dash. I tell you, he can't be beat. It's only a question of pluck laying the odds. Hanged if I won't stand every penny of the one hundred thousand pounds which I have got on him. They are taking twenty to one now.' Suppose he is beaten, she says quietly. Then I shall be a beggar, he answers with a laugh. But I'm not afraid. By God, I'll stand my chance. He turns as he speaks and tries to get through the crowd. What can she do? She has little or no influence with him, and if she had, this is no place in which to reason and argue with him. She feels downcast and sad for although she, like everyone else, has little doubt in her mind that Corey Glenn will win, there is just the chance, ever so slight, that he might not. And if he does not, well, what then? Ruin, she soliloquizes half aloud as she puts the question to herself and answered it in that one word. There is a bitter smile on Flora Desmond's face, for she knows what ruin would mean. "'Are you looking Corey Glenn over Lady Flora?' inquires a voice at her elbow. She has no need to turn around to discover the speaker, for she knows the voice full well. It is that of Hector de Strange. He has heard the conversation between Sir Reginald Desmond and his wife, and as the former elbows his way through the crowd, he has pushed forward and sidled into his place by her side. "'Yes, Mr. de Strange, I am.' she answers just a shade wearily. Like everyone else, I am looking at the crack. I suppose he can't be beat. By the by, she adds hastily, you've a horse in this race, haven't you? I've a mare, he replies significantly. And whom do you think is going to ride her, qualified for a jockey's license and everything on purpose? Who? she inquires absently. Why, Bernie Fontenoy! The boy's a splendid rider, and mark my words, Lady Flora, if he doesn't win, it will be a near thing between my black queen and Corey Glenn. She starts. She has never known Hector de Strange to err yet, 
and her husband's rash act recurs more forcibly to her mind. "'May I see Black Queen?' she inquires hastily. "'Certainly,' he answers. "'Come with me.' They push through the crowd, still surging round the chestnut horse, and make their way across the paddock to a quiet spot, where very few people are observable. A coal-black mare has just been stripped, and her jockey is standing close beside her. Its colors are tinseled gold. "'That is Black Queen,' observes Hector de Strange quietly. "'You are a good judge of a horse, Lady Flora. What do you think of her?' She does not reply, but walks up to within a few paces of the mare and looks her over keenly. She sees before her an animal which, to her eyes, used though she is to good-looking horses, is a perfect picture. The mare is coal-black, there is not a white hair on her. She is faultlessly shaped all over. "'I think that I never saw a greater beauty in all my life!' exclaims Flora Desmond, and there is a true ring of admiration in her tone. As she speaks, the Duke of Ravensdale comes up. "'So you're going to win the derby, Bernie, are you?' he inquires jokingly, as he raises his hat to Flora Desmond and holds out his hand to her. "'Nice youngster, that,' he continues, addressing her. "'Gave me no peace till I gave him leave to ride, which I never should have done, had it not been at Hector's request. And now I do believe that he thinks he is going to win.' "'I shall have a good try, Evie,' the boy replies in a meddled voice. I can't do more than ride my very best, can I, Mr. Destrange?" "'No, indeed, my boy, that you cannot,' answers this latter kindly. "'Do your best. No one can ask for more.' There is a light in Bernie's eye, a flush on his cheek. Flora notes them both. Full well she knows what they mean. "'Mr. Destrange,' she says hurriedly, moving a few paces aside, May I speak to you for one moment?" He follows her with a grave, inquiring look. "'I know you never bet,' she continues quickly. "'But do you know what they are laying against Black Queen?' "'A hundred to one,' he answers carelessly. "'Then will you do me a great favor? she answers in a sad, pleading voice. "'Though you never bet, and I hate it, Will you lay me out a one thousand pound in the ring, so that if Black Queen wins, I shall win one hundred thousand pounds? I wouldn't ask this of you, only you seem so confident in your mare, and—and—' "'I understand,' he answers quietly. "'I'll do it for you, Lady Flora. The race lies between Corey Glen and my mare, and I quite understand why you want to back the latter. I couldn't help hearing what Sir Reginald said over there. It's on his account, is it not?" "'It is,' she answers bitterly. "'As you heard him, you will quite understand.' "'Leave it to me,' he continues in a kind voice. "'I'll just give Bernie his last instructions, and then I'll hurry across and do your commission. Will you come over to the stand with Ravensdale?' "'I will,' she answers, with a grateful look in her eyes. And now Bernie has got his last orders, and the beautiful mare, with its handsome jockey, is moving slowly across the paddock to the course. The tinseled gold on the boy's jacket gleams and sparkles in the sun, and many an admiring eye rests on the two as they pass out. He has come out at last, and is at the tail end of the long file of horses parading past the stand. Everyone is so keen on singling out the favorite that Black Queen at first is not much noticed. Yet the sparkling gold on the jacket is bound to attract the eye, and the fact that Lord Bernard Fontenoy, brother of the Duke of Ravensdale, is riding the coal-black mare, awakens interest in the dark steed. "'Why, it's little Lord Burney riding, I do declare!' giggles Mrs. de Lacy Trevor to Lord Charles Dartrey, who is leaning over her chair pointing out the horses and jockeys on the cart in her lap. "'What a duck he looks! Oh, I wish Dodo was here!' Can't think what Destrange means by putting the boy up. He can't win, and it would only break his heart," ejaculates Lord Charles superciliously. "'How old is Lord Burney?' queries Mrs. Trevor in an interested voice. 
Oh, I do wish the darling would win." "'That's impossible,' said Lord Charles loftily. "'Nothing can beat Corey Glen." They are cantering down to the post now, the favorite with great raking strides covering his ground comfortably, and playing kindly with his snaffle as his jockey leans forward and eases him a bit. Bernie has not started the Black Queen yet. He is leaning down talking to his brother. All eyes are upon him, however, as they see him squeeze the Duke's hand which is laid on the boy's knee. Suddenly, however, he dresses himself upright. "'I must go now, Evie dear,' he says, and there is a tremor in his voice. "'Oh, pray that I may win!' Then he sets the mare into a canter and follows in the wake of the others. "'My word! That mare moves well!' exclaimed Sir Horsey Dufresne nervously. "'Don't half like the look of her. Think I must have something on her for luck. Belongs to that deuced lucky fellow de Strange, too. Shouldn't be surprised to see the gold jacket flashing in first. Bosh! answers Sir Reginald Desmond, who is standing next to him. My dear old fellow, it's only throwing your money away. Corey Glenn can't be beat. But Sir Horsey Dufresne is not convinced, and goes off to see what he can get laid him against the mare. "'Suppose you back the favorite old chap?' inquires another shining light at Sir Reggie's elbow. "'Yes,' answers this latter shortly. "'Had a plunge, eh?' persists the golden youth, who doesn't know a horse from a cow. "'I've got a hundred thousand pounds on him,' is Sir Reggie's curt reply. He is looking through his glasses, and his face is rather white. "'Oh, I say!' blurts out the youth as he edges off to tell all those who will listen to him. "'I say, you know, Desmond's laid out a hundred thousand pounds on the favorite!' There is a murmur in the stands. It runs through them all like an electric shock. "'They're off!' is the hoarse cry that resounds suddenly from hundreds of throats. To an excellent start, Lord Markovitch Bolster has dispatched the lot, and as they all stare through their glasses they can perceive that Hamptonian has taken up the running closely followed by Masterman Reddy, Holyoaks, and Castephen. Lying fifth is the favorite, and two lengths behind him gleams a flashing spot of gold. A strange horse is overhauling the lot, Hamptonian drops back, and the stranger creeping to the front makes the pace terrific. But fast as he goes he cannot shake off the chestnut, who apparently without effort is going easily enough, and keeping his place at fifth in the crowd. Now the spot of gold seems nearer up. It passes Corey Glen and falls into fourth place, Kestephen retiring to the rear. They are racing down the incline. Masterman Reddy begins to tire, and the spot of flashing gold closes up to Holyoaks. These two come along neck and neck, Corey Glen just behind them, the strange horse still in the van. Tottenham Corner is reached. They round it in the order named, and enter the straight. But here the stranger is in difficulties, and holy oaks and black queen, on which sits the spot of gold rigid almost as marble, begin to close upon him. A little more than a quarter of a mile from home they reach him, and he flings up the sponge, retiring to the rear. There are only three horses left in the race now, holy oaks, black queen, and Corey Glen. This latter is drawing up to the first two named, with great raking strides he is alongside them and quickly the three are abreast. A distant roar sounds in Bernie's ears, there is a film over his eyes, his heart feels as if it must stop beating, but he sits very still and does not attempt to urge his horse any faster. Suddenly he sees a flash on his left. The jockey who is riding Holyoaks has his whip out, and Bernie knows he has nothing any longer to fear from him. He glances to the right. The great chestnut is flashing along. There is no whip needed there. "'Oh, God, let me win!' burst from the boy's pale lips as he tightens his rein ever so little and touches the mare gently with the spur. He is surprised at the effect. He thought she had been going fast before, but she is going faster now. She is quite a length ahead of Corey Glen, and the jockey of this latter is visibly surprised. He has begun to ride the horse at last, and his whip is actually out. Corey Glen wins! Corey Glen wins! comes the wild shout from the stands as the noble chestnut, 
with a supreme effort, closes with the Black Queen. They are hardly fifty yards from the winning post. The roar is terrific. Bernie hears it, but he can see nothing now. He makes, however, a final effort, and calls on the mare once more. He has never used his whip. "'Cory Glenn wins! Cory Glenn wins!' the words pierce to his brain. He has done his best, he cannot do more. He knows this well, yet would to God he could win. "'Cory Glenn wins!' Ah, they don't know the Black Queen. She has answered the boy's last call. She has made one more magnificent effort, and shooting ahead of the favorite passes the post a winner by a neck. What a yell goes up from the ring! Blank, deadly consternation is in the faces of the backers. In the stands there is very little cheering. Hardly a soul in all that vast crowd has backed the dark black mare. And Sir Reginald Desmond is still standing where we left him. He is deadly pale, his arms are folded on his chest, there is despair in his eyes. "'Had a bad race, old chap? I fear we all have,' says a voice at his elbow. He laughs and turns towards the speaker. This latter starts as he notices the ghastly, haggard look on the young baronet's face. "'Yes, well, yes, haven't had a good one,' answers Sir Reggie coolly, taking out his cigarette-case and leisurely selecting a cigarette therefrom. "'Have a cigarette, Fernley?' "'No, thanks, Desmond. Am just going to have lunch. Wonderful race young Bernie Fontenoy rode there. Won't the brat be proud?' "'Oh, ah, yes, won't he?' answers Sir Reggie absently. His thoughts have wandered again. He is looking ahead into the black future. Now that it is too late, he is cursing himself for a fool and an idiot. Oh, why did he not take Flora's advice? The stand in which he is is nearly empty. Everyone is making off to get lunch. In a few minutes it is entirely deserted. He sits on alone in it. The cigarette he had lit so ostentatiously not long since has gone out, but it is still clenched between his teeth. The future will rise to his mind. How can such as he face it? He has never been brought up to do anything. He is ill-read, ill-taught, and ignorant. He has never given his mind to do anything but amusing himself. And now, if he pays the ring what is justly owing to it, he will be a beggar with nothing to live on and nothing to look forward to but misery, and, in his eyes, disgrace. Poor Sir Reginald! He feels his position acutely, it is burning itself into his brain. He feels that it is past endurance, that he cannot face it. "'I'll go home,' he says wearily to himself. "'I can't face Flora after this. It's all too dreadful.' He rises wearily and goes out. The back of the stand is more or less crowded by the hangers-on and scum of every racecourse. How he hates and loathes the sight of them now! How their rough, coarse, pleasure-seeking faces bring up to his mind, with haunting horror, the great loss which he has sustained! He is staying near the racecourse and has not far to go, so he hurries through the crowd and makes straight for the laurels, which is the name of the place. He reaches it and tries the front door. It is locked. Of course, no one is expected back yet. He knows of a side entrance, though, through the smoking room. Ten to one, the careful servants have forgotten it. He walks round and tries it. Yes, true enough, they have. Very quietly, Sir Reginald slips in. In another moment he is upstairs and in his bedroom. He turns the key in the door and goes over to the writing table. His face is still deadly pale, and he walks like one who has had too much to drink. He sits at the table and scrawls a few hurried lines. They are as follows. "'Flora, dear, forgive me. I've been a brute and an idiot. Would to God I had taken your advice. But it's too late now. You'll pay the ring for me, dear. Let them know it was my last wish. If I lived we should be beggars and I can't condemn you and the little one to that. But at my death you'll get all that money that is to come to you and the child. Good-bye, dear old girl. You've been good and kind to me. 
this is about all Reggie can do to show you he is grateful. Goodbye. Forgive. She has been looking for him a long time, and so has Hector de Strange, but there is no sign of Sir Reginald Desmond anywhere. At last she can stand it no longer. I must go back to the laurels, she says. Perhaps he is there. Estcourt, who is standing by her, offers to accompany her, and thither they proceed in silence. Of course, when they reach the house, no one has seen him. The servants assure her ladyship that Sir Reginald has not returned. They must have seen him if he had. They forget to add that the greater number of them have been perched on the high wall surrounding the laurels, during the greater part of the day, watching the races. "'I'll just run up to the bedroom and have a look,' says Flora to Estcourt. "'I won't be a minute.' He waits below, but almost directly hears his name called. "'Estcourt, come here!' He races up the stairs. He finds her standing outside the door of a bedroom. "'I can't get in,' she says hurriedly. "'I've called, but there's no reply. Oh, Estcourt, do you think he is in there?' He makes no reply, but runs downstairs. In a few minutes he is back with a hatchet. Curious servants are following him. "'Stand back,' he says to Flora. She obeys, and the young man brings the hatchet with tremendous force against the lock. Three, four, five strokes, and he has broken it to shivers. Then he opens the door. Sir Reginald Desmond is seated at his writing-table. His left hand is beneath his chest, his head is resting on the table above it, his right is outstretched and hanging over the side. Just below it on the floor lies a revolver, and drip, 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 dripping onto the chair in which he sits is a stream of running blood. Who shall judge him as he lays there silent and fast stiffening? For he is dead, and blame and praise fall on his ear alike, now hushed in death. Those who may do so can, I cannot. End of Book One, Chapter Six Book One, Chapter Seven of Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, Book One, Chapter Seven. Were you in the Commons last night? Did you go to hear Hector de Strange? Rather. I think all the world was there, or trying to be there. I don't think I have ever seen such a crowd before. What a wonderful speaker he is, to be sure! Yes, with the exception of Gladstone, I don't suppose there ever was one like him, or ever will be again. Talk of orators of bygone days! Pooh! They never came up to him! Well, the women have got the suffrage in full at last, thanks to him. The next thing is to see what use they'll make of it. Better, perhaps, than we men have. The speakers are two men, the Honorable Tredegar Molyneux, M.P., and Colonel DeVoe of the Blues. Nearly four years have passed since the events related in the last chapter. The world has been slowly marching forward, and many things have happened between that time and this. In the political world, and in Parliament, like everywhere else, Hector de Strange has made a stir. His eloquence and debating power are the wonder of all who hear him, and his practical, sympathetic knowledge of the social questions of the day has made him the idol of the masses. He has just succeeded in carrying his woman's suffrage bill by a large majority, thereby conferring on women, married or unmarried, in this respect, identical rights with men. And now today, in the Monster Hall of Liberty, which he has founded, and which has been erected by the lavish subscriptions of the women of Great Britain, Ireland, and the world at large, he is to preside at the ceremony of its opening. It is a monster building. Talk of Olympia, of the Albert Hall, why, they are dwarfs beside it. In shape it is circular, and towers aloft towards heaven, its great dome pinnacle crowned by a cap of glass which report declares to consist of a million panes. Around this glass a gilded crown is twined, and holding it there, one in a kneeling attitude, the other upright, with one hand high upraised towards heaven, 
are two gilded women's forms. They are the statues of liberty. The interior of this vast structure is wonderful to look upon. The floor or center is raised, and constructed so as to move on a pivot slowly round. It consists of an immense ring, the middle of which presents the appearance of a giant circus. On the right, or side facing the great entrance, is a monster swimming bath, and exactly opposite on the other side of the circus is a huge platform. Suspended in mid-air, a very network of trapezes and other gymnastic appliances hang, while stretched tightly beneath them is a monster net. Around the arena, with a low palisade separating it from the same, is a broad circular horse-ride, and raised slightly above this, running all round in a similar manner, a roomy promenade. Then come tier above tier, tier above tier of seats, amidst which here and there boxes are placed promiscuously, while dotted about all over these countless and seemingly never-ending stories are cosy platforms enthroned in a wealth of green, where abundance of refreshments are obtainable. The seats come to an end at last, and are replaced by six broad balconies running entirely round the building, and built one above the other. Opening onto these balconies are what appear to the spectator in the arena as thousands of pigeonholes. In reality they are doors, communicating each one with a tiny but compact room, in which stands a bed, two chairs, a wash-hand stand, a small dressing-table, and a writing-table. It is stated that in all, opening off from these balconies, are ten thousand rooms. These rooms have been included in the building to accommodate women students from all parts of the world, who may wish to take part in the physical drill or educational advantages afforded by this great central institute for the training of womankind. Attached to the Hall of Liberty are large lecture-rooms, studying-rooms and reading-rooms, and in connection with these a monster library. Outside the building are the stables, one of the wonders of London, the grooms being entirely composed of girls and women, and clustering round the mother structure like a miniature town are the pretty cottages and dwellings of the immense staff of instructors, teachers, and lecturers connected with the institution. It is a wonderful structure, and its erection is a triumph, the magnitude of which can hardly be measured for Hector de Strange. It was he who conceived it, it was he who submitted it to the approval of his countrymen, and it was he who commanded the expenditure of the voluminous subscriptions, which in answer to his appeal poured in from all quarters of the globe. No less marvellous was the rapidity with which it arose, thousands of workmen having been employed in its construction. It is finished now. It towers to heaven like a mighty giant from some unknown world. The gilded statues of liberty flash back the sun's rays, and stand out to view for miles and miles around. All London is flocking to the ceremony of its opening, for is it not the genius that conceived and placed it there to be the principal functionary of the day? All is orderly in the streets. The vast crowd is held and kept in check by the military and the police. A good-humoured, happy crowd it seems to be, with here and there occasionally a little rough horseplay. But no harm is done. The people are on their best behaviour, for Hector de Strange, the idol of that people, has appealed to them to preserve order. The vast building is rapidly filling. Since the great doors have been thrown open, it has been one successive influx of people. There is no disorder, for there is a separate passage for the holders of each class of ticket and along these the incomers are marshalled by the liveried servants of the establishment. It is a wonderful sight to see the people swarming to their places, and all the while through the building trembles dreamy music, which thrills the senses and makes them all aglow with gentle and tender feeling. At last it is full. There is not an inch of standing-room in all that vast space set aside for spectators. Every seat is appropriated. Not a vacant one to be seen and it is computed that there are fifty thousand. Every class is there, from the prince and peer to the laboring man and peasant, all have come, attracted by the all-powerful genius who is to address that monster meeting this day. Imbued with the same feeling, impelled by the same curiosity, attracted by the same sentiment, that crowd of mixed denominations and sexes awaits his coming in breathless expectation and it has not long to wait. 
the clock is striking eleven, when a distant roar is heard, and the strains of martial music come floating from afar. In the great hall of liberty a sudden hush has fallen. The dreamy music has ceased abruptly, and a supreme silence reigns. Again that roar! It is like the booming of a thousand cannons. It is steady now and unceasing. It rushes forward along the dense walls of spectators that throng the streets on either side of the way up which Hector de Strange has to pass. A whisper runs through the vast hall, a whisper of suppressed excitement and expectation. "'He is coming! He is coming!' is on everyone's lips, as with eyes aglow and hearts thrilling with eagerness the people bend forward in their seats to watch for him. The crowds outside the building have begun to cheer. The martial music is very distinct now. The plaudits are every moment becoming more intense, until they break into a deep and prolonged roar. As they do so, the great folding doors of the Hall of Liberty are thrown open, and the people rise in a body to their feet. He is entering now, preceded by the band of the White Regiment of the Women's Volunteer Companies, playing a march triumphant, he passes through the giant portals. His head is bared, and he is mounted on a milk-white horse, which he sits with grace and ease. As he does so the sun shines down on his dark auburn hair, lighting it up with the tints of old gold that play amidst the curls which nestled on his high, white brow, like the sapphire light in his glorious eyes shoots forth with a gleam of triumph as he surveys the magnificent scene. He is dressed in the White Guard Regiment uniform of the Women's Volunteer Companies, of which he is commander-in-chief. But the regiment itself is his own especial one. It was the first which he established four and a half years ago, when he first took the matter in hand. The idea has prospered since then, and the women enrolled in all the companies of the volunteer force number two hundred thousand. It is a fitting uniform for the occasion, one which he has done well to don. For the first business of today's ceremony will be the march past of the picked of the companies of these two hundred thousand. He has ridden round the broad, spacious horse ride, followed by one or two especial friends, conspicuous amongst whom is the Duke of Ravensdale. The cheering is deafening. It never ceases for a moment. It swells and swells again, like the mighty mid-ocean waves that bear onwards in their wild career to break on the lone seashore and now he has dismounted, and with his friends has taken his place on the evergreen flower-decked platform. Even as he does so his dark sapphire eyes are raised aloft, and sweep with their dreamy gaze the thousands that throng that vast hall of liberty, as if seeking amidst the multitude one especial form. It is even so, and as they roam the sea of faces, all turned to his, they are suddenly brought to a standstill. The anxious, searching look within them dies away, giving place to one of calm contentment and repose, for Speranza is there. The mother's eyes are fixed upon her child. Through the filmy distance of space cannot Gloria perceive this well? For a moment, one brief moment, the hero of the hour is Gloria Dolora, in the next he is Hector de Strange. The audience is still cheering. It seems as though it will never cease but he raised his hand and like magic a great silence falls. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he begins, and the clear, exquisite voice thrills through the huge building. "'I shall have a few words to say to you before I declare the Hall of Liberty open, but first we will witness the march past of the representatives of all the companies of the Women's Volunteer Force, of which I have the honour to be Commander-in-Chief.' A flourish of trumpets and loud cheering greets this announcement. Once more the great entrance doors unfold, the band of the White Regiment strikes up a march, as through the portals, ten abreast and mounted on grey horses, that regiment advances at a trot. And at their head is one whom we have seen before. Very handsome she looks in her uniform of pure white cloth, with the gold facings glittering on her breast and her sword in its silver sheath dangling sparkling at her side. Flora Desmond is not greatly changed since we saw her last, in appearance certainly, but over her life has come a wondrous transformation. 
she is Hector de Strange's right hand, and in aiding him to carry out his noble aims is thoroughly in her element. The white troopers advance at a trot rapid enough, but as each line passes the platform on which Hector de Strange is standing, they break into a canter, increased to a gallop, whirling round the broad-spaced horse-ride in magnificent order. Looking along the serried line of horses' heads, hardly a hair's breadth in difference can be distinguished, so compact is the position which is maintained throughout the ranks. The march strains cease, and give way to a flourish of trumpets. Simultaneously, the galloping steeds are reined on to their haunches, remaining motionless as statues. Thus they stand until the voice of Flora Desmond is heard giving the order to retreat, when they fall into position and retire at the trot, she riding round to join her chief on the platform. And in this wise, headed by their respective bands and officers, representative companies of Hector de Strange's two hundred regiments march or gallop past him. The ceremony occupies some two hours, but they roll by all too quickly for the spectators who, spellbound by what they see, watch the revolving scenes with the keenest interest. The last one closes appropriately. Crashing and rumbling through the wide-open entrance dash the artillery. They come on at a rapid pace, and wheeling round into the vast arena form up into splendid line. The work of detaching the horses and unlimbering the guns is that of a moment. In the next, a tremendous roar rings forth from the mouths of a score of cannon which have been rapidly charged and fired. Ere the echoes have died away, the horses are again attached, the guns as rapidly limbered up, and one by one the gun carriages dash from the scene, the great doors closing upon them. Then cheer after cheer rings through the densely packed building as Hector de Strange advances to the front of the platform to speak. But he is raising his hand once more, as though appealing to be heard, and again a great silence falls. "'We are here today,' the bright clear ringing voice declares, "'to open a building the magnitude of which cannot be measured by any other in the world. The Hall of Liberty stands here today as a living witness to the desire of woman to be heard. It was six years ago that I first saw it in my dreams. It is reality now and will endure through all time as a memorial of the first great effort made by woman to shake off the chains of slavery that ever since our knowledge of man began have held her a prisoner in the gilded jails of inactivity and helplessness. I stand here today prepared to deny that woman is the inferior of man, either in mental capacity or physical strength, provided always that she be given equal advantages with him. I go further still, and declare that in the former respect she is his superior. You deny it? Then give her the chance. I have no fear but that she will prove that I have not lied. You have today seen passed in review ten thousand representatives of the two hundred thousand volunteers that in a little more than four years have been enrolled and drilled into the splendid efficiency witnessed on this memorable occasion. Will you pretend, or seek to tell yourselves, that in warfare they would be unavailing? I laugh at such an idea to scorn. One of our most heart-stirring writers, I allude to White Melville, has left it declared in his writings, that if a legion of Amazons could be rendered amenable to discipline, they would conquer the world. He was right. The physical courage, of which men vaunt so much, is as nothing when compared with that greater and more magnificent virtue, moral courage, which women have shown that they possess in so eminent a degree over men. And hence physical courage would come as an agreeable and welcome visitor where hitherto it has been forcibly denied admission. Men and women who hear me today, I beseech you, ponder the truth of what I have told you in your hearts. You boast of a civilization unparalleled in the world's history. Yet is it so? Side by side with wealth, appalling in its magnitude, stalks poverty, misery, and wrong more appallingly still. I aver that this poverty, misery, and wrong is, in a great measure, due to the false and unnatural position awarded to woman. 
nor will justice, reparation, and perfection be attained until she takes her place in all things as the equal of man. And now, my friends, I will detain you no longer. In this great hall of liberty woman will find much which has long been denied her. It is but a drop in the ocean of that which is her right, yet is it a noble beginning of that which must inevitably come. I declare this hall of liberty to be open." That is all. He says no more, but with a stately inclination to the vast audience turns back to where his friends stand. His horse is led forward by a youthful orderly in the uniform of the White Regiment, and as he mounts it the band strikes up once more. Bareheaded as he entered, he rides slowly from the scene of his triumph, and passing again through the portals of the Hall of Liberty comes out into the densely wall-lined street, amidst the roar of the thousands that are there to greet. Such is the welcome of the people to Hector de Strange. End of Book One, Chapter Seven Book One, Chapter Eight of Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900. Book One, Chapter Eight. Lord Westray sits alone in his sanctum in Grosvenor Square. There is an anxious expression on his face, for he has been expecting someone who has not turned up. He has already consulted his watch about a half a dozen times, and he consults it again. Then he gets up and rings the bell. He can hear it tinkling downstairs from where he sits. A smart servant, he thinks to himself, would have answered it quickly. Yet he would think this no longer if he could only hear his smart servant's remark anent that bell. James calls out that worthy, who is seated in the room on an easy armchair in front of the fireplace, with his feet against the chimney piece. What bell's that? My lord, sir is the laconic reply from the lackey outside. Oh, ah, thanks. Let him ring again. The bell does peal again, this time furiously, and Stuggins, with a face of disgust, pulls his feet down from the chimney-piece. My word, what a hard time of it we haves! he ejaculates to himself as he rises slowly from his seat to go upstairs. On reaching Lord Westray's sanctum, however, his face is composed and affable. "'This is the second time I've rung,' exclaims Lord Westray angrily. "'Surely, Stuggins, there is someone in the house to answer the bell.' "'I was in my room, my lord, and did not hear it,' responds Stuggins in a conciliatory voice. "'Has no one called yet, Stuggins?' "'No one, my lord.' "'Well, he'll be here at any moment now. Mind he is shown up without any delay.' "'Certainly, my lord.' and the sleek, overfed domestic goes off smiling. Ten minutes later, and there is a ring at the doorbell. Lord Westray starts and listens. "'It's he!' he ejaculates briefly. And in a few minutes the he is politely waved in by Stuggins. "'Mr. Trackham, my lord.' "'All right, Stuggins, shut the door. Not at home if anyone else calls. Very good, my lord.' The door is shut, and Lord Westray rises and shakes the newcomer by the hand. "'Glad to see you, Mr. Trackham,' he observes heartily. "'Began to fear you were not coming. A little late, eh?' "'A little, my lord, but I was usefully employed.' "'May doubt where she is, Mr. Trackham?' "'Yes,' responds this latter solemnly. Lord Westray rubs his hands delightedly. "'Where?' "'Near Windsor, my lord.' I found it out by shadowing Mr. Destrange. Capital! exclaims Lord Westray with a laugh. And does she still go under the name of Mrs. Delara? Yes, my lord. Now, Mr. Trackham, what are your plans? Mr. Trackham puts on a mysterious look, walks quickly to the door of the sanctum, and opens it suddenly. What do you want? he inquires sharply of someone without. If you please, sir. I was just coming in to see if his lordship had rung," answers Stuggins stolidly, who had never quitted the outside of the door since we last saw him, and who had been listening intently all the time. 
Lowell Westray did not ring, answers Mr. Trackham coldly, and you are not required. Oh, very good, sir, and Stuggins retires defeated and much put about. Mr. Trackham watches the butler's retreating form till it is out of sight, then he closes the door softly and returns to his original place near Lord Westray. These are my plans, my lord. I propose to take down two of my men by rail. Two will be ample, as more might attract attention and be in the way. I shall send a brougham and a smart pair of trotters the day before. I have ascertained by observation that Mrs. Delara invariably goes for a walk in the evening by herself, that her servants do not sit up for her as she writes in her study late at night, and I have further ascertained that she is frequently in the habit of leaving the house before anyone is up and coming up to town. This is a most valuable point, as her absence will attract no attention. But to be safe, I possess myself of some of her writing paper and a sample of her writing, and a note will be duly left apprising her maid of her departure, and intention to remain in London for a few days. By Jove, Mr. Trackham, you are a smart one. I don't see how your plan can fail," exclaims the wicked Earl with a laugh. "'I never fire, my lord, in any of these little businesses,' answers Mr. Trackham with a suave smile. "'But ain't you afraid of the police finding you out?' inquires Lord Westray just a little nervously. Mr. Trackham laughs outright. "'Police!' he ejaculates contemptuously. "'What's the good of them? Think they know a lot, know nothing. Why, my lord, the police are useless in matters of this sort, and as for detectives, why, it's easy to green them up the wrong way. I don't fear them. I'm a match for every noodle detective in and around Scotland Yard, I am." And Mr. Trackham gives a self-satisfied laugh. "'Well, Mr. Trackham, when is it to be?' inquires the Earl anxiously, after a short lull in the conversation. "'It's to be the day after to-morrow,' answers Mr. Trackham. Tomorrow my men go down. I shall follow, and just give them a squint at the place, and then they'll be all prepared for the next day. Never fear, my lord. By Wednesday she shall be in your power." "'In my power!' the words came triumphantly, though mutteringly, through the ground teeth of the man whom Speranza de Lara had called, and justly so, a fiend in human shape. Yes, she had spurned him, loathed him, defied him forbidden him her presence. Through these long years he had striven to regain her in vain, and now, ah, now, he would be amply and surely revenged. Well, I am sure, Mr. Trackham, I cannot thank you sufficiently for the excellent way in which you have laid your plans in order to carry out my commission," he says warmly. And now to business. I am to give you fifty pounds down now, and the remaining one hundred fifty pounds when the transaction is finally accomplished. Is not that so?" "'It is, my lord,' answers the vile creature blandly. Lord Westray pulls out a drawer in his writing-table, and taking out a check-book is not long in writing off an order for fifty pounds to the credit of self. This he hands to his visitor, who accepts it deferentially, and commits it to a greasy pocket-book after which he takes up his hat and stick preparatory to leaving. "'Won't you take something?' inquires the Earl with his hand on the bell. "'A glass of sherry, brandy and soda, or what?' "'No, thank you, my lord, nothing,' answers Mr. Trackham. "'Must keep a clear head in my business. Thanks all the same.' They shake hands, these two scheming monsters, both intent on a base and ruffianly deed, yet one of them is regarded as a gentleman is received and welcomed by society, is high in the graces of the government of the day, and accounted a clever man and useful statesman. Clothed in these mantles of virtue, he is free to do as he pleases. Wickedness will not bar society's doors against him, or lose him his high preferments. Is he not a man, one of the dominant and self-styled superior race? Therefore is he not free to do as he pleases? The day has come, a hot July one. Down upon the dusty country roads the sun has burnt fiercely all day long. The cattle and beasts of the field have eagerly sought for shade and refuge from the torturing flies that ever haunt their presence, but evening has fallen at last, and with it relief has come. 
It is cool and pleasant along the banks of the old Thames. The silver streak glides sluggishly along, with the moon's pale light playing softly upon it. The stars twinkle merrily forth to endure their brief sweet rain. Nature looks ghost-like in her mantle of sleep. A fairy cottage, half hidden in walnut trees and clinging ivy, peeps forth upon that scene. The smooth lawns around it gleam white as the driven snow beneath the moon's soft gleams. Tall dark trees rise up behind in ebony framework, making an efficient background, while through the still air trembles and quivers the nightingale's exquisite song. It would seem at a first glance as if all were asleep in that cottage. But no, there is yet a light left in one of the rooms on the ground floor. Suddenly a pair of window-doors in it are flung open, and a tall, graceful woman steps out through them. Her head is uncovered, the moon gleams down upon the thick masses of pale gold hair that cover it, and shines in her glittering eyes of turquoise blue. It is Speranza de Lara. "'What a glorious night!' she soliloquizes to herself. "'I suppose my darling is speaking now. She said it would be about ten o'clock. Oh, Harry, my precious long-lost love, would that you could see our child now!" She has pressed the ring with its glittering brilliance to her lips, the only ring she wears. The stones flash and sparkle in the moon's light like gems of living fire, beautiful, pure, and shining as the love that is next to her heart. Much more than a score of years have passed away since Harry Kintor died in her arms, but if she lived through countless scores of years that love would burn just the same. She wanders along the gravel carriage drive, her thoughts busy with the past. Anon they fleet forward to the future, and then a light of triumph dances in her eyes. But it is with the past that she is chiefly occupied this night, for it is the fourteenth of July the anniversary of the day on which her darling died. She has passed along the shady avenue and entered a tiny straggling path shut in by tall dark trees. It is a glade upon which the gardener has not been allowed to bestow his fostering care. He has been forbidden this spot by his mistress, who loves to leave it in possession of the primrose and violet, the wild anemone or dark blue hyacinth that nature has scattered so plentifully around. It is Speranza's safe retreat, away from the outside world, the spot where she best loves to roam. All is quiet. Not a sound disturbs the tenor of her thoughts as she walks quietly along. Suddenly, however, her eye is arrested by a gleam of light in front of her. The next moment two dark forms spring forward in her path and she sees that they are men. Speranza is no coward. We already know that well. Screaming is without her ken, she has no knowledge of it. Of fear she only knows the name. If it is a thrill that permeates the body from head to foot, and sends the blood rushing through the system with irresistible impetus, then Speranza knows what that strange, mysterious sensation called fear is. But then it only makes her feel defiant. She has no thought of fleeing. Her impulse is to stand and face the danger, whatever it may be. Who are you?" she asks in a quiet, measured voice. And what do you want here? You, is the laconic answer as the speaker seizes her by the arm and deftly getting behind her endeavors to draw her two elbows together. The pain is excruciating, but Speranza's blood is up. She is no weakly woman, helpless with lifelong inactivity and want of muscle power. She is strong and flexible as wire, and makes her assailant feel this too, as with a wrench she frees herself and springs backward behind him, facing them both once more. With a foul oath the man who had first attacked her bears a short, ugly-looking knife, and his companion does so as well. "'No use resisting!' exclaims this latter. "'If you do, you'll get a taste of these. Better come quietly!' She does not even answer them. Her lovely head is thrown back, her blue eyes shoot defiance, even while in them trembles the look of despair. Her hands hang clenched by her side, but she never quails for a second. They rush at her, their knives poised threateningly. 
She seizes the blades with both her hands and holds them with the grim clutch of a last great effort. With a brutal laugh they jerk them backwards, and the sharp, keen edges cut clean into her tightly closed palms. Out pours the rich, dark blood from the cruel, gaping wounds, as with a low cry, the first that has escaped her, she lets go her hold. Then, with the ferocity of tigers, they spring upon and force her to the ground. In another moment the gag is on her mouth, tight straps are round her arms and ankles, and she is a prisoner at their feet. "'Come on, quick now!' exclaims one of the men. "'My, Bill, she be a strong plucky one, and no mistake. If it hadn't been for that there root, we shouldn't have mastered her so easily. No, no, we should!' The root referred to is the jagged, stumpy end of a fallen tree. Against this Speranza's head had struck in falling, rendering her senseless. No wonder they tied her so easily. They lift her between them and carry her across the copsewood towards a low hedge, outside which lies the road. Over this they hoist her, and then lay her down on the pathway, one of them giving a long, low whistle. There is an answering whistle down the road, a rumbling and stamping as of carriage wheels and horses' feet. Two lights gleam through the darkness, like the eyes of some terrible monster, and the next moment a carriage dashes up. Got her inquires a thin, spare man, jumping out. "'Right as a trivet, sir,' they answer. "'Well, put her in. Look sharp. No time to lose. I thought I heard footsteps as I came along.' And Mr. Trackham, for it is he, holds open the door. They obey his orders without more ado, and then he jumps in. "'Now then, look alive, men. One on the box, one in with her and me.' It is done the men are sharpens. They know their master, and he knows his men. The next moment the carriage is bowling along towards Windsor, en route for London. Who will track them? Who discover them? Not the detectives of Scotland Yard. End of Book One, Chapter Eight Book One, Chapter Nine of Gloriana or The Revolution of 1900. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900. Book One, Chapter Nine. There has been a late sitting in the House of Commons, a protracted debate on the crowded condition of the filthy alleys and slums in that most wonderful city of the world, London, has kept members fully occupied. But twelve o'clock, midnight, has struck and the commons are dispersing. It has been a great night for Hector de Strange. He has spoken for an hour and a half to a spell-bound audience. For does it not know full well that the subject of that night's discussion is one in which he is no novice, it having been undertaken on his own motion? He has spoken for an hour and a half, and has told them many things. Has he not a right to do so? None like him have dived into those terrible slums, have visited night after night, as he has done, those abodes of crime, of vice, of wickedness, and of misery. He knows them well, and has depicted them as they are, to the wondering representatives of a nation, in language of which he alone is master. He has seen much, and knows much of the horrors which he has depicted so vividly, yet not even he knows some of the depths of infamy that exist in that cesspool of modern Babylon. He has yet another experience to incur. "'Dear old Hector, that was a grand speech of yours!' exclaims the Duke of Ravensdale, who, having been an attentive listener during the debate, has run down to join his friend as the latter leaves the commons. "'Come across to Montagree House, and let us have a little supper!' Wish you would stay there the night, old man." "'I can't, Evie,' replies Hector. "'I have to go down to Windsor by an early train, and must go home and order my things to be packed up. But I'll come across for an half an hour or so and have a mouthful, as I went without my dinner.' They walk along, linked arm in arm, towards Whitehall, and as they do so, Big Ben chimes out the hour of half-past twelve. "'How time flies, to be sure!' remarks the young duke thoughtfully. "'Funny thing time is, eh, Hector?' "'It is,' answers this latter gravely. 
a something without being, shape or substance, and yet a thing that has been and is and yet shall be. What a happy chap you ought to be, Hector! I don't suppose there's an hour in your life which you can look back upon as having wasted or misspent, save in doing good and trying to help others," exclaims his friend in an almost envious tone. Would to God I could say the same of myself! Hush, Evie! Don't try and make me vain, and don't run yourself down before me. I won't allow it. God knows you are earnest enough in your desire to do good, and dear Evie, you have succeeded. I don't suppose there's another in your position who has done so much. I never had such a good true friend as you in all my undertakings, except one, and of course I accept her." "'Her!' exclaims his friend in a somewhat surprised voice. "'Whom, Hector?' "'My mother,' he answers quietly. "'She has been my right hand through life. I could not have got on without her.' "'Your mother, Hector!' says the Duke in a low voice. Have you a mother alive?" "'Yes, Evie, and one of the best that ever lived. I will introduce you to her some day. She knows you well by hearsay, for I have often spoken of you to her. But a favour, dear old Evie, don't ever mention her to anyone, promise me.' "'Of course not, Hector. You know the simplest wish of yours is law to me. Well, here we are. We'll finish our chat inside over some soup and oysters, and anything else you'd like to have." The Duke's hand is on the bell, but he pulls it very softly. "'Won't do to peel it,' he remarks. "'The sound would awaken Bernie. He's such a light sleeper, and always will get up to welcome me if he awakes, dear little chap.' "'Let's see, how old is he now?' queries Hector de Strange. "'Well nigh sixteen, is he not? He's a dear lad and I like him especially on account of his love for you. He does love you, Evie." "'Yes,' answers the Duke softly, "'and I love him. Bernie is all I have got to love, unless it be you, Hector.' He does not see the bright flush that rises to Hector de Strange's beautiful face, or the passionate look in the sapphire eyes. It might have startled him if he had but the great massive doors are unclosing now, and he enters, followed by his friend. "'Supper in my study, Repton, please,' he exclaims. "'Is Lord Bernard asleep?' "'Fast, your grace,' answers that individual confidentially. "'His lordship wanted to sit up for your grace, but when I gave him your grace's message he went straight to bed.' "'That's right,' says the Duke heartily. "'Bernie's a good lad. God bless him.' The two have moved on into the Duke's study, and Repton has hurried off to command His Grace's supper to be served immediately. He has pompous manners, has Repton, a high opinion of himself, and certain notions of his own importance and dignity, but he is a good servant nevertheless, and a faithful one. He is not of the Stuggins class. He would as soon dream of keeping His Grace waiting for his supper as of jumping over the moon. The consequence is that, in the twinkling of an eye, supper is served in the study, and the two friends, as they sit discussing it, wander off on some favorite theme, so that the time passes quicker than they think. Suddenly they are startled by hearing a bell peal. The Duke springs to his feet. "'Good heavens! What can that be?' he exclaims nervously. "'Is it Bernie's bell? Is the boy ill, I wonder? I must go and see. It's past two o'clock. It's the front door bell, I think, says Hector de Strange. Hark, Evie, there are voices in the entrance hall. Open the door and listen. The Duke does so. A woman's voice is plainly distinguishable, appealing to Repton. For God's sake, he hears her saying, let me see the Duke. I must see him. It is a matter of life and death. If you tell him it is for Mr. de Strange, he will see me, I know. I have no orders from His Grace to admit you," answers Repton pompously, and certainly cannot disturb His Grace at this hour. You must write or call again tomorrow morning, and all I can do is to report your wish to His Grace." He bangs the door to as he speaks, but the next moment steps sound behind him, and Hector de Strange has seized the handle and pulled it open. His face is very white, and there is terror in his eyes. Rita. 
he calls out. Is that you, Rita? My God, what brings you here? Mr. De Strange, she burst out with a low, glad cry. Oh, are you here? Thank God, thank God! She has rushed forward and seized him by the hand, and the Duke, who has followed close behind him, recognizes in the youthful, fair-featured girl the sad, haggard, careworn, starving creature whom but a few years back he had rescued from prostitution and degradation. Yet in what a terrible condition she seems! Her dress is torn and mud-stained, her shoes likewise, her fair, soft hair disheveled and hanging about her face and down her back, while her expression is that of one scared by a terrible fear. "'Come quick, come quick!' she cries imploringly. "'Before it's too late! Oh, Mr. De Strange, they have waylaid her and carried her off! I saw her bound, with her poor cut bleeding hands, and could not help her. But I know where she is, and can guide you to the place if you will only come!' "'Rita!' exclaims Hector de Strange, in a voice the very calmness of which fills her with awe. "'Come into the Duke's study for a minute, and explain yourself. Follow me.' He leads the way, with Evie Ravensdale following, and she close behind the Duke. As for Repton, he is rigid with astonishment. The three enter the study, and the door is closed. "'Now, Rita,' queries Hector excitedly, "'explain.' "'I will,' she cries again. "'It is your mother. She was out in her favourite walk this evening about ten, and I was coming home rather late from Windsor. I saw her attacked by two men in the spinney, bound hand and foot, after having been knocked senseless. A carriage drove up, and they put her into it. My first impulse was to rush to help her and shout for assistance, but in a moment I reflected how useless that would be. I determined to hang on to the carriage behind, and see where they took her to. It was a terrible drive, but God helped me, and I succeeded, though I'm about done. I saw the house they took her into. I know the spot well. I can take you there straight now. But come, please come, or it will be too late." There is a look of fury and hatred so intense in Hector de Strange's eyes that the Duke can hardly recognize him as the sweet, gentle-featured friend whom he loved so dearly. "'Evie,' he says in a strained, unnatural voice, "'I can explain nothing now. It is impossible. But you can trust me, Evie. My mother, my precious mother, is in terrible danger. Will you help me to save her?' The Duke's reply is laconic, but Hector knows its meaning. They are simple words. I will." "'Then come!' he exclaims feverishly. "'Lead on, Rita, brave, plucky Rita! I'll never forget what you have done today. She does not reply, for they are hurrying out of the room. They are in the hall now, and both Hector and Evie Ravensdale have seized their hats. But the next moment the Duke has slipped a loaded revolver into his pocket and handed another to his friend. "'Take this,' is all he says. "'You may want it.' There is a four-wheeler at the door. They all three get in quickly. As Rita does so, she gives the order, "'Whitechapel, quick!' she adds, "'and you shall be paid well!' The cab-horse trots swiftly along. The hope of a substantial fare has given the cabby wings. No well-bred brom horse could go quicker. He flies along, does that old cab-horse. On the outskirts of Whitechapel, Rita calls a halt. "'We must get out here.' she observes. Mr. De Strange, please give the cabman a sovereign and tell him to wait. He obeys her. He can trust her, can Hector De Strange. Ever since the day when, at Evie Ravensdale's request, he had appointed her as his own and his mother's secretary, Rita Vernon has served him with a fidelity and painstaking exactitude of which he knows no parallel. She leads the way through the dark, uninviting streets. She knows the locality well. She learnt it years ago, before Evie Ravensdale came there to save her from a doom far more terrible than death. She had declared then that she would willingly die for him. The same feeling animates her now. For Evie Ravensdale, Rita Vernon would deem it a happiness to die. They have passed through quartz and filthy alleys, through streets well and ill-lighted. Very few people are about. 
Only a policeman or two on their beats pass them as they move along. Now they are turning into a sort of crescent or half-square, with houses superior to those of the localities they have traversed. As they do so, Rita turns to the two men following her, and pointing to a house at the further end, exclaims, There! There are no lights in the windows. The place is silent and dark. How shall we get in? asks the Duke. There is a bitter smile on Rita's face as she replies. I will show you, but remember, you must play your part. I shall pretend I am bringing you here, and that there's another woman coming. I'll order a room, and once in there I know how to find her." She says no more, but passes swiftly along the pavement, they close at her heels. On reaching the house she pulls the bell softly. The door is opened cautiously, and a woman's face peers out. "'What's wanted?' she inquires suspiciously. "'I've brought these gentlemen here,' answers Rita. "'We want a room. Your best if it's empty.' "'Can't have you to-night,' replies the woman. "'The whole house is took.' She is about to shut the door when Rita springs into the opening. The next moment she has the woman by the throat. "'Quick!' she cries in a low voice. "'Gag her! Tie her hands and feet!' No need to speak further. Both Hector de Strange and Evie Ravensdale have obeyed. Three handkerchiefs suffice to gag the woman, tie her ankles together, and her wrists behind her. Then they look at Rita. "'Put her in here,' exclaims this latter, opening a door on the right. "'It's dark. Never mind. I know the place. She's safe there.' They lift her in and lay her on the floor. Rita closes the door and locks it. A dim light is burning in the hall, but no one is stirring. Only in the distance they think they catch a sound of voices. "'Come on,' she says excitedly. "'I am sure I can find them. They'll be in the best room. Follow me." She goes up the stairs quietly, her companions as noiselessly following. On reaching the landing she turns down a passage to the right and comes to a halt opposite a door. "'Listen,' she says in a low tone, "'you too should know that voice.' But she has no time to say more. Pale with fury, with murder in his eyes, Hector de Strange has burst open the door. A flood of light almost blinds him as he enters but through it all he sees the mother that he loves. Speranza de Lara is stretched on a sofa. Her ankles are still tightly secured, her wrists likewise. Around her, like a cloak of gold, falls her lovely hair. There is a mad, wild look in her eyes, terrible to behold, but her lips are mute and speechless, for she is gagged. And beside her stands that monster, that petted roué of society, that fiend in human shape, the Earl of Westray. There is a loud cry as a shot rings through the silent house. End of Book One, Chapter Nine Book Two, Chapter One of Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900. Book Two, Chapter One. It is the year 1900. Men are hoping that it will be a peaceful one after the factious bickerings of 1898 to 99. While the National Party and the Progressists have been snarling over contentious bones, they have omitted to notice in the by-elections unmistakable signs of public weariness and disgust with squabbles so profitless. The National Party, into which the Unionists have been merged, and the Progressists, a party arisen on the ashes of the Liberals, have failed to take warning by these signs. Woman's suffrage, established as law by the action of Hector de Strange, has materially altered the aspect of the old state of things and brought about a thorough and healthy change of thought in many places. The women have given their aid enthusiastically to Hector de Strange, and worked heartily in support of the youthful reformer. Almost every by-election has returned a de Strangeite candidate. Now at length the general election is over, and the Parliament returned is a curious one. Including the Irish, Scotch, and Welsh home-rulers, 
the Destrangeite members are in a majority, the National coming next, and the Progressist last. And yet the majority referred to is a somewhat precarious and unworkable one. For if the two latter parties choose to combine, they can wreck the new government completely. No one knows this better than Hector Destrange, who, having been invited by his sovereign to form a cabinet, has succeeded in doing so, and occupies the proud position of Prime Minister at the age of twenty-eight. Only sixteen years since Gloria de Lara made her vow to the wild sea-waves, and now? Has the prayer that accompanied that vow been answered? Not yet. Is it not tempting defeat, my child, to introduce the bill at so early a date? Mother dear, it is my only opportunity. The position I hold is, I know, quite untenable for any length of time. The government may be defeated at any moment, and then my chance is gone. Though I have not the slightest hope of carrying the bill, I shall yet gain a tremendous point by its introduction. I shall be defeated on it without a doubt, but it will be before the country, and I can appeal to the country upon it. Every right, my child. The speakers are Speranza and Gloria de Lara. The former is now fifty years of age, but years sit lightly on her shoulders. The new century beholds her as lovely and youthful-looking as ever. Time has not played havoc with that fair face. And the pale golden hair is golden still. No sign of whitening age is discernible in the thick tresses. It seems as though fair youth will never quit her side, for Speranza is unchanged. Unchanged in all save one thing. Since that terrible day upon which the last chapter closed so abruptly, there has dwelt in Speranza's lovely eyes a hunted, haunting look of fear. She has never quite recovered from the shock of that most awful trial, and none dare mention to her the name of Lord Westray. He has never been heard of since that day. His disappearance at the time caused the greatest excitement. Men declared that he must have been foully murdered, and his body secreted by the murderer or murderers. Of course the blame was thrown on the Irish, with whom Lord Westray was no favourite. Not long before his disappearance he had been appointed Chief Secretary for Ireland, an appointment that had given the greatest dissatisfaction to the Irish. There was nothing beyond surmise, however, to account for his fate. They are sitting in Speranza de Lara's private room in Montegri House, which has been her home ever since the terrible day above referred to. Apartments in the huge building have been set aside for her use, for it is the delight of Evie Ravensdale to lavish upon the mother of his dearest friend on earth all the affection and love of a son. And his love is returned indeed, for Speranza's heart has gone out to him with all the love of a mother, a love only surpassed by that which she feels for her child. The great day has come at last, when Hector de Strange is to introduce to Parliament his bill for the absolute and entire enfranchisement of the women of his country. The bill, it is whispered, is not a mere stepping-stone to future power for the sex, but a free and unfettered charter of liberty, a distinct emancipation from past slavery, a final and decisive declaration that women are not man's inferiors, but have as clear and inalienable a right as he to share the government of their country, and to adopt the professions hitherto arrogated by men solely to themselves. Hector de Strange's colleagues have been made aware of the bill's contents, and have loyally and nobly elected to stand or fall upon it. They have all been selected for their singularly wide and sympathetic views, and are not likely to forsake their chief in the moment of trial. So also can he depend upon all the Destrangeite members, without a fear that there will be a single seceder from their ranks. But he knows that the defeat which he expects will come from the united forces of the Progressists and Nationals, who for a time have buried their feuds and disputes in the desire to defeat the revolutionary schemes of Hector de Strange. There is a knock at the door, and in response to Hector's invitation to enter it opens, and a young man comes in. 
It is Lord Bernard Fontenoy, very much grown since we saw him last. He is eighteen now, but looks older, and is the Duke of Ravensdale's secretary, the Duke being Minister for Foreign Affairs. A telegram, Mr. De Strange, he observes. Will there be any answer? Hector takes the missive and opens it. It is from Flora Desmond, and runs as follows. The ten regiments have marched in from Oxford, and are quartered in the Hall of Liberty. Twenty-seven miles completed in eight and a half hours. Not a single private fell out of the ranks. We'll be down to see you in an hour or so. No, Bernie, no answer, thanks. Is Evie in yet? queries the recipient. I'll go and see, answers the youth, vanishing as he speaks. Dear mother, I must leave you now, but will see you again before I go to the house. Estcourt and Douglasdale will be here directly, and the latter is to escort you to-night," observes Hector de Strange, rising and kissing Speranza. The mother throws her arms around her child. The anxious look in her eyes is intensified. "'My darling, may all go well with you to-night. It is foolish, I know, but there is a foreboding of evil next my heart which I cannot shake off, try as I may. Ah, Gloria, if aught should happen to you, my precious child, what would your mother do? Why, mother, what ails you, dearest? Evil happen to Gloria? What fancy is this? Of course I expect defeat, but that will not be evil, merely the beginning of a great end. I do not allude to that, dear one, but to something quite different. Gloria, I had a terrible dream last night. I saw him close to me, the being that I loathe. He had you down, and stood above you with a naked sword raised threateningly. I rushed to save you, but ere I could avert his arm, he had pointed it straight down at you, and pierced you to the heart. Tush, mother, a mere dream, that's all. You must not dwell upon it. Dear mother, put it from your mind. Would to God that I could, Gloria! but it haunts me like a spectre and will not pass away. However, my child, I must not damp your spirits with my fancies. Go now to your duties, from which I must not keep you, and mother will do her best to drive the dream away." That's right, motherling. Do for Gloria's sake. He kisses her tenderly and goes out, for he hears Evie Ravensdale's step approaching. The two friends and colleagues meet just outside the door. Let's go to your room, Evie," he says gently, and let us have a chat before I go to work. Chats with you are a luxury now. We don't find much time for them, do we? By the by, I have just had a telegram from Flora Desmond. The regiments have reached the Hall of Liberty. She reports the last march of twenty-seven miles in eight and a half hours, with not one single fallout from the ranks. Yet they would have us believe that women are weak, feeble creatures, unable to endure fatigue. There is the lie direct." They pass on into the Duke's study, a room full of pleasant memories for Hector de Strange. Many a happy hour has he spent here with the truest and best friend of his life, the one man whom he loves above all things, and, with the exception of Speranza, the only being to whom he is passionately attached. A big oil painting hangs above the fireplace. Two figures are represented on the canvas. One is a tall, dark-haired, dark-eyed man, with long silken moustache and aristocratic mien, the other of shorter and slighter build, with a face of exquisite beauty. The features are those of a very young man, the eyes are sapphire blue, the glossy, close-curling hair of a deep, old gold color. It is easy to recognize the former as Evelyn, Duke of Ravensdale, the latter as Hector de Strange. The picture has been executed by the Duke's order, and represents the two friends' first meeting, ever memorable for both. They sit on alone together, these kindred spirits, happy in the communion of each other's thoughts. They are seeking to scan the future, and what it will bring, diving into the days that have yet to come. With E. B. Ravensdale, it is a firm belief in the ultimate success of Hector de Strange's scheme, 
a supreme and absolute confidence in his young chief's ascendant star. "'I wonder who will be the first woman Prime Minister,' he observes dreamily. He is looking into the glowing coals and does not notice the flush that rises to Hector de Strange's cheeks. "'Ah, yes, who indeed?' echoes the latter quietly. "'Sometimes I think, Hector, that I can see her. Certainly I have seen her in my dreams,' continues the young duke softly. "'Can you describe her, Evie?' asks his friend. "'Ask me to paint your face, Hector, and then you have her in living life. Yes, my woman Prime Minister is an exact counterpart of Hector de Strange. Ah, Hector, if you were only a woman, how madly I should love you! For love you as I do now, it can never be the same love as it would be if you were a woman. It is fortunate that the shaded and softly subdued lamps in Evie Ravensdale's study are low, or certainly the look in Hector de Strange's face would have betrayed the secret of Gloria Delara. As it is, he only laughs softly. So, I am your woman's ideal, am I, Evie? he asks in a would-be bantering tone. Yes, Hector, you are. Your face is too lovely for a man's. You ought to have been a woman. And yet if you had been, the glory of Hector de Strange would be an untold tale. There is, alas, no woman living, I fear, who would have been able to beat down the laws that held her enchained as you have done. How the women worship you, Hector, and rightly!" The front door-bell is pealing. In a few minutes the study door is opened and Lady Flora Desmond is announced. She comes in, easy and graceful, her white guard's uniform fitting to perfection her supple and agile form. People have grown accustomed to Hector de Strange's women volunteers. The uniforms no longer strike them as strange and unfeminine for custom is the surest cure with offended Mrs. Grundy. "'What a dense crowd there is, to be sure!' she exclaims, after first greetings have been exchanged. "'I had a hard work to get my guards through it. But they are in order now, and a clear way is kept right up to Westminster, so you will have no difficulty in getting your carriage along, Mr. Destrange. "'Is it so late?' he inquires in a surprised tone. Evie and I have been talking away, and did not notice how the time was slipping. Pray wait here. I shall not be many minutes dressing. I must wear my white guard's uniform tonight, you know." "'Very well, Mr. Destrange. I will wait for you here,' she replies. There is a ring in Flora Desmond's voice which tells her how happy she is. She has never dreamed of seeing such a day as this. He is standing on the steps of Montagree House clad in his white guard's uniform. A long line of the white regiment keep the road clear to Westminster. The crowd is dense all around. Nothing but a sea of faces can be seen, and the cheers of the people have grown into a hoarse, continuous roar. Thousands and thousands of women are amongst that crowd, women with hearts full of love and devotion for their hero, women who would account it a happiness to die for him at any hour women who are strong in their gratitude for what he has done, and is trying to do for them. He has entered the carriage that stands in waiting in front of the ducal mansion, and with Evie Ravensdale has taken his seat therein. As it drives rapidly towards Westminster, the mighty volume of cheering is again and again renewed, a few hisses being here and there noticeable. How describe the scene within the House of Commons? To attempt to do so would be but to court failure. The precincts are thronged until there is no standing room. There is eager expectation on every face. The roar of the crowd outside has penetrated the vast building and tells those within that he is approaching. A thrill runs through that assembly of princes, peers, commoners, and ladies who are there to await his coming and then the silence of intense expectation falls on all around. He is entering now, and walks slowly forward to take his seat. He is received with a burst of enthusiasm by his own colleagues and party. 
and is watched with interest by every woman who looks down upon him from the spacious galleries that at his insistence have been erected for ladies, in place of the wild beast cage originally considered by men as good enough for the inferior sex. And now he has taken his seat while awaiting the usual formalities, and the eyes of the house are upon him. It would be a trying position for an old parliamentary hand, one used to many years of debate. Is it not just a shade so for Gloria Delara, as she sits there under the name of Hector de Strange, preparing to do battle for her sex? But she has risen now. The silence of death has fallen once more on the house, for the clear, beautiful voice is speaking at last, and this is what it says. End of Book Two, Chapter One Book Two, Chapter Two of Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred. Book Two, Chapter Two. Mr. Speaker, I make no apology to you, sir, or to honourable gentlemen for the bill which I am about to introduce to the House. It is a bill embodying a simple act of justice to woman, a tardy though complete offer by man to repair the wrong which he has done her in the past. Now the bill is simple enough, and contains no ambiguous clauses. It states in terse, clear language what it is that we propose to bestow on woman, the rights to which she is entitled, and the manner in which we suggest that they should take effect. We have rightly, though tardily, bestowed the suffrage upon her. That was an act which should have been performed years ago, but one which has been delayed by much of that unwieldy, unworkable machinery that clogs and hampers the operations of the Westminster Parliament. I refer to the numerous local affairs of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, which, as you know, I have frequently expressed as my opinion, might be more profitably, efficiently, and quickly disposed of in the separate countries named, leaving the time that is consumed here in attending to them free for the consideration of great imperial and national social questions, which are, alas, and dangerously so, being pressed into the background. The bestowal of the suffrage on woman is a practical acknowledgment by man that woman has a right to be considered as a being who can reason, and who can study humanity in its various phases, and act on her own responsibility. It is not for me here to seek for the causes which have hitherto led man to believe to the contrary. His belief, in a great measure, has been due to woman's weak acceptance of his arbitrary laws for I do not suppose it will be pretended by any one that the laws laid down for the sacrifice of woman's freedom were the creation of a woman's brain. But this weak acceptance of these arbitrary laws cannot fairly be ascribed entirely to the fault of woman. Slavery in no form is natural. It is an artificial creation of man's, and woman's slavery cannot be taken as an exception to this maxim. She has, in point of fact, been subjugated to bondage, a bondage which has, in a manner, become second nature to her, and which custom has taught her to regard as a part of the inevitable. But if honourable gentlemen will believe me, nature is stronger than custom, and more powerful than law. Nature is a force that cannot be repressed finally and absolutely. It is like an overwhelming torrent against which you may erect monster dikes, which you may dam up for a time, but all the while the waters are rising, and will find their level in the end. Through countless years woman has been repressed. Every human force and ingenuity of man have been employed to establish her subjection. From religion downwards it has been the cry, Women submit to men a cry which I may safely say was never originated by herself. Now nature has established a law which is inviolable. It has laid down the distinction between the sexes, but here nature stops. Nature gives strength and beauty to man, 
and nature gives strength and beauty to woman. In this latter instance, man flies in the face of nature, and declares that she must be artificially restrained. Woman must not be allowed to grow up strong like man, because if she did, the fact would establish her equality with him, and this cannot be tolerated. So the boy and the man are allowed freedom of body, and are trained up to become muscular and strong, while the woman, by artificial, not natural laws, is bidden to remain inactive and passive, and in consequence weak and undeveloped. Mentally it is the same. Nature has unmistakably given to woman a greater amount of brain power. This is at once perceivable in childhood. For instance, on the stage girls are always employed in preference to boys, for they are considered brighter and sharper in intellect and brain power. Yet man deliberately sets himself to stunt that early evidence of mental capacity, by laying down the law that woman's education shall be on a lower level than that of man's. That natural truths, which all women should early learn, should be hidden from her, and that while men may be taught everything, women must only acquire a narrow and imperfect knowledge both of life and of nature's laws. I maintain to honourable gentlemen that this procedure is arbitrary and cruel and false to nature. I characterise it by the strong word of infamous. It has been the means of sending to their graves unknown, unknelled, and unnamed thousands of women whose high intellects have been wasted, and whose powers for good have been paralysed and undeveloped. To the subjection and degradation of woman I ascribe the sufferings and crimes of humanity. Nor will society be ever truly raised or ennobled or perfected until woman's freedom has been granted, and she takes her rightful place as the equal of man. Viewing this great social problem in this light, we have deemed it our duty to present to Parliament a bill, establishing as law, firstly, the mixed education of the sexes, that is to say, bringing into force the principle of mixed schools and colleges, in which girls and boys, young men and young women, can be educated together. Secondly, the extension of the rights of primogenitor to the female sex, so that while primogenitor remains associated with the law of entail, the eldest born, not the eldest son, shall succeed the owner of property and titles. Also, that all the professions and positions in life, official or otherwise, shall be thrown open as equally to women as to men. And thirdly, that women shall become eligible as members of Parliament, and peeresses in their own right, eligible to sit in the upper house as well as to undertake state duties. Such is the drastic, the sweeping measure by which we desire to wipe off for ever and repair, though tardily, a great wrong. Honourable gentlemen will perceive that we take no halfway course. We are not inclined to accept the doctrine of by degrees, believing that this would only prolong the evil and injustice which daily arise from the delay in emancipating the female sex. And I will now as briefly as possible set forth to honourable gentlemen the arguments in favour of the three clauses contained in this bill. With regard to the first one, namely the advisability of educating girls and boys, young women and young men together, it is necessary to point out that the system of separating the sexes throughout their educational career has arisen chiefly from the totally different forms of education meted out to each. We hold that these different forms are pernicious and morally unhealthy, calculated to evilly influence the sensual instincts of the male sex, and to instill into the other sex a totally wrong and mischievous idea of the right and wrong side of nature. We are convinced that this system has been productive of an immense amount of immorality and consequent suffering and degradation in the past, and that the system of elevating nature into a mystery is the greatest conceivable incitement to sensuality and immorality. We hold that there should be no mystery or secrecy anent the laws of God. We hold that in creating mystery we condemn God's law, namely nature to be what it is not, indecent. 
and we hold that the system of separating the sexes, of telling all to the one and enshrouding everything in silence and mystery to the other, has had the evil effect of producing immorality, so wide and far-spreading as to be frightful in its hideousness and magnitude. While it has been productive of millions of miserable marriages, of disease, and of evil immeasurable and appalling. Nature tells us truths which we cannot condemn as falsehoods, however much we may avert our eyes from their light. Nature tells us that it is natural for the male and female sex to be together. If we bring up the young to face this truth, if we bring up the young to accept as natural and rational the laws of pure and unaffected nature, they will accept it as it is. But if we clothe it in boys' and men's eyes in fanciful garments, and leave girls and women in ignorance of its truths, we must expect the terrible and horrible results which have followed such unnatural teaching through centuries of time. We therefore emphatically in this clause record our protest against the system of teaching the young to regard nature in a false light, in other words, to judge of God's laws as impure. We believe such a system of education to be, as we have said, an incentive to the male sex to do wrong, while totally unfitting the female sex to do right. The beginning of all immorality on woman's side has sprung from ignorance and from the system of mystery and the tendency to declare indecent that which cannot be so, being God's law. In regard to the physical condition of the sexes, we hold that where equal opportunities are afforded to both of strengthening, developing, and improving the body, little material difference will be found in the two. There are many strong men in this world, and there are many strong women, as there are weakly men and weakly women. I have never heard it yet argued that because a man is not strong in body, he is therefore unfitted to take part in the affairs of state. Yet woman's weakness is one of the reasons adduced for excluding her therefrom. We believe that in a big public school, say, for instance, at Eton, if girls and boys were admitted together, that girls would very soon prove that neither physically nor mentally were they inferior to boys. Nor should such a pernicious doctrine be ever inculcated into the boy's brain. He should not be brought up as he is now, to look down on his sisters as inferior to him, nor should those sisters be told that he is their superior in strength and mental capacity. It is a doctrine the perniciousness of which is far-reaching, and a distinct infringement of the natural. This leads us to the consideration of the second clause, the adoption by women of those professions hitherto arrogated to themselves solely by men. We are of the opinion that, granted a similar education as men, women are in every way as fitted to occupy those professions. I may be allowed here, perhaps, to refer with pride to that magnificent body of women over two hundred thousand strong, who are now enrolled in the regiments of the women's volunteer forces, of which I am proud to call myself a member, and whose uniform I am fittingly wearing on this occasion. We have before us a splendid evidence of women's power to combine and come under discipline. These regiments are kept up to their full force and are all due to individual effort and womanly sacrifice. There is no state aid in the question, and yet the efficiency of each regiment is perfect. Disbanded and scattered, they can be summoned to their ranks at a few days' notice, without fear that they will fail. I point to this as a brilliant example of what women can accomplish in so short a time, by self-sacrifice and simple determination. The same argument of their efficiency to enter the army applies to the navy, and to any other profession hitherto occupied solely by man. But believing as I do, that with the admission of women into the conduct of affairs of state, wars and all their attendant horrors would quickly become a thing of the past, I dwell shortly on the second clause, passing on to the third, which, in conjunction with the first, I regard as the most important part to be examined. It is now eleven years since county councils were established. 
At the very first elections women were chosen as representatives, but on an appeal to the law they were ousted from their seats. We have wisely remedied that state of things, and no one thinks it odd or extraordinary now to see women sitting in these county councils as members. On the contrary, it is tacitly acknowledged that their presence is, and has been, productive of much good. Well, will honourable gentlemen tell me in what great particulars these county councils differ from Parliament? Both are debating assemblies, and both are conducted on almost similar lines. What is there preposterous and appalling in the suggestion that women should become members of Parliament, and when, by genius or talents, they can attain to such, assume cabinet rank, and claim the right to carry on the affairs of their country? It is merely custom that now debars them, a custom established by the selfishness and arrogance of man, and accepted by woman in the same manner as slaves in the past from long custom accepted the lash from their taskmasters. The taskmasters had established the right to flog their slaves, they had dammed up the slowly rising waters of rebellion, but these rose to their level at last, and overflowed, and slavery is no more. The analogy holds good in the case of woman, whose greatest slavery is not yet entirely overcome that it will finally be is as certain as that the hours of time never go back. You may fight against it, you may pile the dikes higher, you may go on damming the rising waters as you will. But the time must inevitably come when those dikes and dams will crumble away beneath the overwhelming flood, which your own efforts will have entirely accumulated and brought to its tremendous and irresistible strength we may be met with many arguments in condemnation of this bill. One will be that it will obstruct the right of marriage. We deny this. We grant you that it may diminish the number of marriages, but we contend that this will be a blessing rather than a curse. Thousands of miserable unions are yearly affected in consequence of woman's unnatural and one-sided position in society. In all these cases, she does not marry because, with a knowledge of the subject, with every profession thrown open to her and chance to get on equal to men, she is satisfied that she prefers married life? No. In the cases referred to, she marries for money, or for position, or to escape the restraints of home, or because she has no chance of making her way in the world, and the result is that these marriages are miserable failures and the offspring of such either diseased in body or in mind, or condemned to grow up to a life of misery, and, in thousands of cases, immorality and crime. There is a problem creeping gradually forward upon us, a problem that will have to be solved in time, and that is the steady increase of population. If it advances at its present rate, the hour will come when this earth will not be able to contain it. What then? We may possibly by that time have arranged, with the aid of science, for conveyances which shall carry our superfluous population to other realms of light, but it is equally possible that if this be so, those realms may not consent to receive the emigrants. What then? I believe that, with the emancipation of women, we shall solve this problem now. Fewer children will be born, and those that are born will be of a higher and better physique than the present order of men. The ghastly abortions, which in many parts pass muster nowadays, owing to the unnatural physical conditions of society, as men, women and children will make room for a nobler and higher order of beings, who will come to look upon the production of mankind in a diseased or degraded state as a wickedness and unpardonable crime, against which all men and women should fight and strive. The emancipation of women will, I am convinced, lead up to the creation of the great and the beautiful, to higher morals and nobler aims. Yet as we are now, what is the sad reality? In this huge, overcrowded city alone, the greatest the world has ever known, amidst rich and poor alike, teems immorality awful and appalling in its magnitude. 
deeds are committed of which even some of the most vicious have no idea. Thousands are born in our midst who should never see the light of day. Born in disease, these miserable victims of vice and immorality grow up to beget to others like horrors, and in the teeming millions of this vast city alone exist misery and sin too terrible to contemplate. We submit, therefore, to honourable gentlemen that the first step towards the regeneration and upraising of mankind is the emancipation of woman, and with her emancipation the careful training of the sexes together. Convinced that the time has come, when it will be dangerous to delay this emancipation, we have made it the plank on which the government of the day intend to stand or fall. We would further, perhaps, overstep the bounds of custom, and ask that the fate of the measure be decided to-night by a vote taken on it immediately. If the vote be adverse, the government will at once resign, and appeal to the country on the clauses of the bill. They are clauses which, I think, to-night, it would be but waste of time to discuss. They can be discussed before the country if the bill be rejected. But ere I sit down, I would beg of honourable gentlemen to consider the few words which I have had the honour and I thank God the opportunity to make to them. I would appeal to them to put aside party feeling and vote for the common good as their consciences dictate. I solemnly warn them, however, that they cannot put back the hand of time, and that the hour must be reached at last when the cause of woman will triumph. For, as I have already remarked, nature is like the rising waters of a great flood, which the hand and ingenuity of man may restrain for a time, but which must find a level at last and overflow. The course of nature is unconquerable. No art of man can defeat it, wrought as it is, by the hand of God." He has sat down. He has been heard throughout in death-like silence, but now that the ministerialists and estrangeites are cheering him again and again. Yet chill as ice are the nationals and the progressists. They cannot rise to the height of generosity to which he has appealed. In this moment of uncertainty for many, Hector de Strange knows that the bill is doomed. The House has divided. It has recorded its vote. The numbers for and against the emancipation of women have been announced. The author of the bill was no false prophet when he predicted defeat. By a majority of 120 it has been rejected. Then the rafters ring with the wild cheering of the victorious opposition, of that strange medley of parties, that Hating each other cordially, they hate still more the high-souled, far-reaching, justice-loving principles of Hector de Strange. Again and again the cheering is renewed, drowning in its volume the counter-cheers of the de Strangeites, wild, almost ungovernable in its elation, full of bitter meaning, echoing with sneering emphasis the triumph of selfishness over right. He sits there quietly through it all hardly seeming to notice this outburst of the victors. He does not grudge them their momentary triumph. His thoughts do not dwell upon the defeat which he has just sustained. They are far away, out beyond the portals of the present, clasping the warm hands of the future, reading the bright letters that twine their golden circlet round its brow, as they flash their meaning forth in the one word, victory. Be of good cheer, brave heart for victory is at hand. The House has adjourned. It is five minutes past twelve. As the Prime Minister passes out, he is joined by Evie Ravensdale, who at once links his arm within that of his friend and colleague. Although the Duke's carriage is in waiting, these two purposely refrain from entering it, so as to avoid the crowd and the inevitable demonstration which would follow recognition thereby. In this manner they escape detection by the populace. Not entirely, however. Sharp eyes have recognized Hector de Strange. He has not gone many steps when a hand is laid on his shoulder. "'Mr. de Strange,' he hears a voice saying, "'I arrest you in the name of the law.' "'On what charge?' he inquires in a quick, startled voice. "'On the charge, sir, of murdering Lord Westray,' is the reply. 
In a moment, his quick brain has taken in the situation, and he knows that resistance is useless. Very well, he answers quietly. I will go with you. Evie, he adds in a calm, composed voice, please go at once to my poor mother. End of Book Two, Chapter Two